Princess Doe. It's most girls' dream to be called a princess, but in the case of 17-year-old Dawn Olenek, the name Princess Doe had a not-so-happy meaning and a very gruesome end. On July 15, 1982, a body of a young woman was found in Cedar Ridge Cemetery. The cemetery was in the quiet farm town of Blairstown, New Jersey. While making his rounds, gravedigger George Cries found the body laying near the creek bed and immediately called the police. When he was assigned to the case that morning, lead detective Eric Kranz assumed that he would be attending a routine homicide. However, once he arrived at the crime scene, he quickly realized this was anything but a routine case. Her face was beyond recognition, giving investigators very little to go on, and even with countless hours of inquiry, it seemed that Princess Doe belonged to no one. Her outfit was descriptive. Her red top and matching pleasant skirt would be the topic of much debate. At one point, the investigation took a turn west when investigators believed that the body could be that of Diane Jenis Dye, a missing San Jose, California teenager that disappeared on July 30th, 1979. Investigators notified Diane's mother, who didn't think that it could be her daughter, and she was right. The theory that it was Diana was put to bed once the DNA results from Diana's mother, Patricia, came back as no match. The tips flowed in from everywhere in the country, but there wasn't anything for investigators to go on. The police department put together some facts about the anonymous young girl. They learned that Princess Doe was most likely a runaway, who before her death could have worked as a housekeeper under several different names. As time went on, Cran started to become desperate, obsessed even with finding out the identity of Princess Doe. He went so far as to dress up a mannequin in her clothing in hopes of receiving information from the public. He also invited a documentary team in to gin up more interest in the case, painting the picture of a young girl who somebody loved being lost to them. His efforts were unfortunately unsuccessful. Blairstown residents helped to bury Princess Doe in the cemetery where she was found just six months prior. The case was still open and active at the time. The identification and killer of Princess Doe remained a mystery for over 40 years. But in 1999, a woman by the name of Donna Kinlaw shed some new light on the case. After being arrested in California, Donna told the police about some murders her husband had been involved in, some that were still unsolved. Donna told the police that in 1982, Arthur had killed a sex worker in a cemetery, which she knew because she was there to witness the murder. And in 2005, Arthur wrote a letter to police confessing that he killed a girl in New Jersey. At the time, Arthur was in federal prison for the murder of two other women and was believed to have run a prostitution ring. It was suggested that he tried to force Olenek into his business, and when she refused, he killed her. For the prosecutors, the confession wasn't enough to corroborate the story, and it would, unfortunately, be another 17 years before the police would identify Princess Doe. In 2021, with the help of science and technology, the Astria Forensic Lab studied DNA from Princess Doe's tooth and eyelash, which led to the identity of the 17-year-old junior from Bohemia, New York, who lived with her mother and sister. It's still a mystery how or where she met her murderer, Arthur Kinlaw, and how he was able to get her to New Jersey. But for Detective Kranz to be able to put a name to the girl he gave the name Princess Doe was, quote, very nice. Forty years to the day that the body of Princess Doe was found, she reclaimed her birth name, and at the press conference, family members wore her photo pinned to their clothes to honor her. A year after the body of Princess Doe was found, she became the first person to be entered into the FBI's missing persons database, and before she was identified, the case remained one of the country's most interesting and perplexing murder mysteries. The Christmas Tree Lady December 18, 1996, just after 9 a.m., 
The body of an unidentified woman was found at Pleasant Valley Memorial Cemetery in Annandale, Virginia. The deceased woman had been suffocated by the bag placed over her head while she was listening to a cassette tape through headphones. Next to her was a backpack, two typed notes, two $50 bills, and an eight-inch Christmas tree. One of the notes gave instructions and an admission of her suicide. It read, Deceased by own hand. Prefer no autopsy. Please order cremation with funds provided. Thank you, Jan Doe. One $50 bill was for the coroner, and the other was for the cemetery. Even though alcohol and Valium were found in her system, it was determined that she had taken her own life. The authorities still had no idea who the woman, dubbed the Christmas tree lady, was. She was reported to be a Caucasian woman with copper red hair, around five feet tall, aged between 50 and 70 years old. This information didn't give investigators much to go on because no one had reported anyone who resembled her missing. It would be 25 years before investigators found out the name of the woman. However, some questions are still not answered. Joyce Marilyn Myers Summers was finally identified in July of 2022 thanks to DNA recognition. David Meyer, an 88-year-old man living in Virginia Beach, was thought to be Joyce's brother. For him, it had been so long since he had seen Joyce that he wasn't sure if the artist's sketch of the copper-haired woman was her and directed investigators to a sister who confirmed the identity of Summers. Annette said of her sister's death, the way she planned it out, that was her. Joyce, who was born in Davenport, Iowa in 1927, was the oldest of five, but had cut her family off by the time she died. In the early 1990s, the family hired a private investigator to locate her, but they were unsuccessful, and when her brother traveled to Tucson to locate her, he found her trailer abandoned. Inside the fridge, he found a book called The Target Child She Had. The book was about her abusive childhood, which her sister denied. Summers was never reported missing. Kristen Smart On May 25, 1996, an intoxicated student from California Polytechnic State University left an off-campus party of fellow Cal Poly students in the city of San Luis Obispo, California. Around 2 a.m., Kristen Smart was found passed out on a neighbor's lawn by another female student who was at the party. She tried to help her walk back to her dorm, and as they walked along, they were joined by Paul Flores, another student who offered to help Smart get home since his dorm and hers were near one another. According to the woman who found Kristen on the lawn, Paul Flores seemed to appear out of nowhere offering help. Initially, she wanted to stay with Kristen, but the three had reached her dorm and Paul promised to get Kristen home. That was the last time anyone other than Paul Flores, saw Kristen Smart alive. Kristen Smart was born February 20th, 1977, in Augsburg, Bavaria, West Germany. Her parents were teachers for children of American military personnel. She was the oldest of three. The family moved to Stockton, California, where she attended and graduated from Stockton's Lincoln High School in 1995. In 1996, Smart, like many other students at Cal Poly, was finishing up her freshman year. The ambitious teen had traveled the world before she even started college. Family members said of Kristen that she was a seize the day type of person who loved adventure. College for Kristen was hard. She missed being with her family and tried to fit in with other students on campus. Kristen wanted to drop out of school, but at the urging of her parents, she remained at Cal Poly. On the weekend of May 24th, the campus was almost deserted, but Kristen had stayed back at school instead of going home, possibly because her mother was spending the weekend at swim meet with her younger siblings. She wasn't alone, however. Her friend and next-room neighbor, Margarita Campos, was also there. The two had gotten close, even though they were very different. Margarita was shy and introverted. On the night of Friday, May 24th, 1996, Kristen and Margarita Campos was invited to a party by some girls they knew on the campus. 
At Kristen's insistence, the two went, even though Margarita wasn't interested in going. Once they arrived, the party seemed more like a hangout between roommates and wasn't very fun. The girls decided to leave and look for something else to do. They headed to an off-campus area where fraternities were known to be housed, and that's when Margarita decided she had had enough and wanted to go home. Kristen wasn't ready to leave and stayed in the parking lot of an apartment complex as Margarita headed back to the dorm. That would be the last time Margarita ever saw Kristen. The next morning, Margarita said she waited for Kristen to knock on her door and tell her about the fun night she had, but that knock never happened. In Kristen's room, nothing had been moved. Everything was still in the exact same place that Kristen had left it. Her keys, money, and purse were right where they had been. Margarita knew something was wrong. It would be two days later that she alerted campus police that Kristen was missing and she hadn't been seen in days, which was unlike her. However, it was Memorial Day weekend, so campus officers assumed that she may have gone home or was off having fun. Margarita insisted that something was not right. How could she have gone anywhere without her ID? Kristen had a weekly call with her parents every Sunday. The Memorial Weekend Sunday came and went without Kristen checking in. And the following Monday, Kristen's mother, Denise, was finally notified that Kristen was missing. It would take another two days for the campus police to start looking for her. That Friday night, Kristen apparently ended up at a frat party, and according to witnesses, she became extremely intoxicated. However, Margarita said that when she left Kristen, she was completely sober. It is believed by some that Kristen may have been drugged. Others believe she drank too much in a small amount of time, which led to her inebriation. Campus police questioned the young woman who found her passed out on the lawn that morning, and also Paul Flores. Paul told the police that he had walked her as far as his dorm and that she headed to hers alone. That was the last time he saw her. And if that account were true, that was the last time she was seen alive. Authorities didn't interview Paul until six days after Kristen's disappearance, and after doing so, a team brought in cadaver dogs to search the grounds and Paul's room. All of the dogs reacted to a familiar smell of human decay in Paul's room. However, the semester was already over and Paul's room had been cleaned out. For Flores, the plot would thicken. Two days after Smart went missing, he arrived at the Arroyo Grande Police Department for an outstanding DUI warrant, and in his mugshot photo, he wore a fresh black eye. When he was questioned about how he got the injury, he gave three different stories to investigators. To the young women of Cal Poly, Flores was known to be very touchy and aggressive. He had quite a reputation for himself. To make matters even more sinister, in October 1996, a woman named Mary Lassiter rented out Paul Flores' mother's house in the city of Arroyo Grande, where she found a woman's earring. She thought that the earring matched a necklace that Kristen was wearing in one of the many missing posters around the area. She turned the earring over to a detective. However, it was lost before it could be placed into evidence. During the years after Kristen's disappearance, Flores and his family has always maintained his innocence. The search for Kristen continued. The police searched the canyons of San Luis Obispo County for weeks. Even her father helped in the search looking anywhere he could, even dumpsters. Police had hoped to find her within six months, but that didn't happen. In the days following Kristen's disappearance, the family not only endured the agony of not knowing what happened to her, but an onslaught of victim shaming. The campus police filed an incident report that stated in part, Smart does not have any close friends at Cal Poly. Smart appeared to be under the influence of alcohol on Friday night. Smart was talking with and socializing with several different males at the party. In 1997, the Smart family filed a wrongful death suit against Flores, who during the disposition only stated his name. He pled the fifth almost 30 times. Scott Peterson, the man who murdered his pregnant wife Lacey, was a person of interest for a time since Lacey Peterson attended Cal Poly around the same time that Smart did. 
However, there was no evidence to suspect him of having anything to do with her disappearance, so that line of inquiry was closed. Over the last two decades, investigators have searched the home and backyard of Susan Flores, Paul's mother, at least three times, finding no evidence that Kristen was ever there. Even without substantial evidence, Paul Flores remained the only suspect in Smart's disappearance. Unfortunately, Kristen Smart's body has never been found, and in 2002, she was declared legally dead. The case was never considered a cold case. In fact, 2011 would bring a new county sheriff, Ian Parkinson, to San Luis Obispo. Parkinson devoted a lot of resources to finding out what happened to Kristen Smart. The department has since obtained over 200 pieces of new evidence and conducted almost 100 new interviews. The investigators regularly reviewed the case from 2011 to 2016. Thousands of hours and dollars were spent on finding out what happened to Kristen Smart. The FBI even had her filed as a high-priority missing person with a reward of $75,000 for any information in her case. An additional reward of $100,000 was even offered by Good Samaritan for the return of Smart's body. In 2019, a podcast series with 10 episodes renewed interest in the case with details of the possible abduction and the death of Smart by another student at the university. The podcast had over 12 million downloads and led to a new billboard being put up in Arroyo Agrande in January 2020. This new billboard replaced the old one that had been up since 1997. On April 22, 2020, a search warrant was served at the home of Paul Flores. Investigators found roofies and recorded inappropriate videos of Flores with women. A break in the case came in March 2021 was the search of Ruben Flores' home. DNA evidence was found in the yard under a deck of the house, and in April 2021, Paul and his father Ruben Flores were arrested. Paul Flores was charged with the attempted sexual assault and murder of Kristen Smart, and his father was charged with accessory after the fact. Over 1,500 jury summonses were sent out regarding the case, and on June 13th, Jury selection began in the trial of Paul Flores. Opening arguments followed in July of 2022. During the trial, 44-year-old Jennifer Hudson told the jury that in 1996, she was hanging out with friends in a backyard when Paul confessed to the murder. In a later interview with the newspaper outlet, she recalled that the group was watching friends skateboard and listening to music when a public service announcement came on asking for any information on the whereabouts of Kristen Smart. She then told the interviewer, Paul looked right at us and said, that bitch was a dick tease and I got sick of her shit, adding that he claimed to have buried her under a skating ramp at his place in Wasna. Jennifer said she was terrified because his eyes were just empty. He had dead eyes. She stayed quiet for 20 years, fearing that if she came forward, she'd be next. During the trial, Deputy District Attorney Chris Prevell told the jury that Paul and his father Ruben Flores knew where Kristen's body was for the last 20 years, under their deck, and that they treated her burial with less reverence than a family pet. Paul Flores' attorney refuted the claims, telling the jury that the prosecution had only given a bunch of conspiracy theories not backed up by facts. Statements from two women who accused Paul Flores of assaulting them decades after Smart vanished supported the prosecution's theory of Flores trying to sexually assault Smart, then killing her and hiding the body. According to the two women who were unnamed at the trial, Flores sexually assaulted them in Los Angeles between 2008 and 2011. In a separate trial, Ruben Flores, the father of Paul Flores, was charged with accessory to murder after the fact. Because there was no proof that he knew what his son had done, he was found not guilty of helping his son conceal the murder of Kristen Smart. He was acquitted of all charges. Family and friends remember her smile and that she wanted to travel the world and become an architect. They remember she was fiercely independent and a great person. 
The trial of Paul Flores began 26 years after the disappearance of Kristen Smart and lasted three months, resulting in a unanimous guilty verdict by the jury. On October 18, 2022, Paul Flores, the man who was long suspected in connection with her disappearance, was sentenced to 25 years to life. As a result of Kristen's unfortunate disappearance and subsequent murder, the Kristen Smart Campus Security Act was passed 61 to 0 by the California State Legislature. The legislation was signed into effect by then Governor Pete Wilson on August 19, 1998, and the law took effect on January 1, 1999. This law requires all public colleges to work with local police departments about reporting cases involving violence against students and information on missing persons. Baby Holly. January 12, 1981, search dogs in Houston, Texas found two deceased individuals in a wooded area around the city. Tina Gail Lynn Klaus and Harold Dean Klaus Jr. would later be identified as the couple. At the time, the identity of the individuals could not be determined, but law enforcement was sure they were dealing with a homicide. Little did investigators know just how deep the story would go and how long it would take them to find out who the two unfortunate souls were. Harold, who went by Dean, was 22, and his wife Tina was 18. Between December 1980 and January 1981, the families of the deceased individuals received a call from someone who identified herself as Sister Susan. The call came from Los Angeles, and the woman said she wanted to return the family's car. She told the family that the couple had joined their religious group and no longer needed their worldly possessions. To top it off, she informed the families that the couple would no longer be in contact with them. The last time either family had heard from either one of them was in October of 1980. At the time of the disappearance of Tina and Harold Klaus, the couple had a one-year-old baby girl named Holly. She was not found alongside her parents. For decades, the family of Holly Klaus wondered, where is baby Holly? After contacting authorities, the family agreed to meet with Sister Susan in Florida at the Daytona racetrack. When the family arrived, they were met by what looked like three women dressed in robes. Members of the group were known to have traveled through the southwestern region of the United States in the 1980s. Women fitting the description of the members were seen begging for food in parts of Arizona. The group was arrested at the racetrack, but no charges could be brought. In addition, two of the women who claimed to be part of a religious cult said that they took baby Holly to a church in Arizona. They also told officers that they had left another child at a laundromat. The owner of the Coronado Motor Hotel in Yuma, Arizona, remembers seeing a group of people that fit the same description as the women who arrived at the Daytona racetrack. She told a newspaper that, quote, it felt like they had just walked right out of the Bible. She remembered seeing them several times. A cult specialist familiar with the case believes that the cult was called Christ's Family. Christ Family is known to be one of the most extreme cults of the 1970s and 80s. The leader, Charles McHugh, went by the name Lightning Amen. He claimed that he was the reincarnation of Jesus Christ. In 1987, he was sentenced to five years in prison for possessing and transporting meth with intent to sell. The group embraced veganism, smoking marijuana, and did not think children were necessary, which could explain baby Holly being dropped off at a church in Arizona. Holly's biological parents, murderers, have still not been brought to justice. The case is still open. The Christ family cult has been inactive for decades, but investigators believe someone has information. This was not the first. Dean had dabbled in cults. His mother had told authorities that years before his disappearance, he had been attached to a different one. It is likely that Dean and Tina upset the members of the cult and paid the ultimate price for it. However, the investigation goes on. Holly Klaus was spared from the gruesome fate her parents suffered. She was adopted by a loving family and lived out her life not knowing the origin of her birth. It wasn't until 2021 that, with the help of DNA tests, 
that the Klauses were identified by online sleuths using up-to-date geological records, and this year, because of modern DNA technology and ancestry records, baby Holly Marie Klaus, now a 42-year-old woman, has been located. It is believed that the mysterious religious cult could be responsible for the deaths of Tina Gail Lynn Klaus and Harold Dean Klaus Jr. The couple had only been in Texas a short time when the murder occurred. Holly's biological family has been in touch with her as she now lives in Oklahoma with her five children. Brenda Venables In July 2019, the body of Brenda Venables was found in the septic tank of the farmhouse where she and her husband David, a pig farmer, lived in Best Man's Kempsey. She had been missing for 37 years. On May 4th, 1982, David Venables went to Worcester Police Station to report his wife missing. The police searched the farmhouse, the outbuildings, the river, and Venables' cars. Helicopters were even used to search for her. Police did not, however, check the drainage area or the septic tank. The case was treated as a missing person case, and investigators kept tab over the years on any potential movement happening or not happening in Brenda's bank accounts. Nothing did. Brenda met David when she was 23 years old. They had things in common and connected with each other. The two married in June 1960. According to David, Brenda was good company. After her disappearance, police even searched the neighbor's properties, but still came up with nothing. A friend of the couple would later recount that David did not seem overly concerned and didn't appear to be actively searching for his wife. At the time of Brenda Venables' disappearance, she was suffering from the flu and an ankle injury. Brenda was also the main caretaker for her elderly parents. Her disappearance made things very difficult for them, and on top of being desperately concerned for their daughter, they were heartbroken. By all accounts, 48-year-old Brenda was a devoted wife who was well-liked in the farm community and described as kind and caring by her family. Unfortunately for her, David was a philanderer who was known to have affairs, which caused Mrs. Venables to suffer from depression. Reportedly, she told a psychiatrist that she and David were not sharing a bed and hadn't had sex since 1969. A few months prior to her disappearance, she began to have suicidal thoughts. However, when David was interviewed by the police, he said that their marriage was normal and that they did still sleep together. In fact, the couple had shared a bed the night she went missing. He told investigators that he woke up to find her gone. He also told police that he had been in a 14-year relationship with another woman, but claimed it was not an affair. In 2014, David Venerable sold the farmhouse to his nephew and moved into a smaller home close to the property. And in 2019, during some routine maintenance, human remains were found in the septic tank. At first, workmen thought the bones were that of an animal. The small bones were creating a blockage in the septic tank. Not realizing they were human, one of the workers threw the bones into nearby hedges. At a later date, another workman was called in to clear out another blockage, and this time he found a large clump of hair, which he didn't think was that all unusual, except the amount was excessive. He also found what he thought was a bag with bones inside. Andrew Venables, the nephew of David and a new owner of the farmhouse, thought that they might be dog bones. However, shortly after finding the bag, the workman found the human skull. In a panic, he left and shortly after called the police. Initially, the bones found were thought to be those of real estate agent Lucy Lampelou, who disappeared in 1986. However, the remains were later confirmed to be Brenda's. A skull, bone fragments, and hair are all that remained of Brenda Venables. Some clothing was also discovered. In the tank, half a pair of knickers, a pair of tights, remains of shoes, a sweater, and a bra were also found. It would be another year before the bones were identified as Brenda Venables. Once the identification was confirmed, David was immediately implicated in the murder and arrested. He was accused of killing his wife between May 2nd and 5th, 
1982. Neighbors of David Venables said since the man moved into his new home in 2014, he kept to himself and always kept his blinds closed. They would say hello to him out of obligation, but nothing more. After the body was found, David told police that he was devastated when he couldn't find his wife and that she had never done anything like that before. He added when he discovered she was gone, he looked for her in the woods near the house but couldn't see anybody. He even visited a friend's house to see if she was there when he went downstairs that morning, both the front door and the porch door were open. When asked about his 14-year relationship with a woman named Lorraine, he said that the situation was overplayed and he was never going to leave his wife. David described his mistress as volatile, but at other times, she was perfectly okay. He added that he had never met anyone who was quite so changeable. The jury was told that David wanted his wife out of the picture so he could continue his affair. The woman with who David had the decade-long affair died in 2017, but her 1984 statement was heard in court. She said he called her the day after his wife disappeared and that he seemed quite composed and suddenly told me his wife had disappeared the night before and he was phoning to let me know before I read it in the paper. She also said that he called a few weeks later but didn't mention it. She told the police she couldn't understand how he was so calm about the whole episode. During the trial, Mr. Venables was looked on by members of the courtroom and pressed as being calm and emotionless, even telling the jury, I'm not a person to show emotion. When questioned further about the affair, Mr. Venables said he regretted it. But contrary to that statement, the jury also heard that just days after the disappearance of his wife, he visited his mistress to have sex. Witnesses recounted that for Mr. Venable, life seemed to go on after his wife disappeared. When asked about this in court, he said, I had got a job to do. We just had to get on with what we were doing. He also told the court that during that initial search for his wife, searching the septic tank never entered his mind, so he didn't bring it up to the police. He also claimed to remember an officer searching the area and the septic tank, stating that the policeman told him that he searched the tank and was quite satisfied there was nothing in there. However, one of the initial search team members, a retired West Mercia police constable, told the court that the septic tank was overlooked during the initial search because it looked like a pad of concrete. He stated that he never took part in searching the septic tank and walked past it to get to the river area to search and that nobody mentioned searching the tank. Over the years, Brenda's family waited and prayed for her return, but it would be decades before they found out the truth. In July 2019, when David Venables was arrested for the murder of his wife, he was well into his 80s. Mr. Venables claimed Gloucestershire serial killer Fred West may have been responsible for the death of his wife. There was no evidence to suggest any truth to his claim. When David was arrested in 2019, an officer found a book about Fred and Rose West in his home. Investigators also found a document in his car that read, This is a true and honest statement of fact with regard to the disappearance of my wife, Brenda Margaret, in May 1982 indicating to authorities he knew that he would be arrested. During his trial, David Venables' lawyers told the jury that the farmer had arranged for someone to empty the septic tank before selling his home in 2014. The lawyers for David Venables' also claimed Mrs. Venables left her home and either killed herself or met with someone who wished her harm. Even though Mr. Venables told the jury he woke up in the morning and his wife was gone, the jury didn't buy it. They deliberated for 17 hours and with a 10 to 2 margin were able to find David Venables guilty of murdering his wife. In July 2022, he was convicted of the murder of his wife, Brenda Venables. David Venables was sentenced to at least 18 years in prison. When the trial began, Mr. Venables was 88 years old and his lawyers told the court that he would not likely see the light of day again. He would die in jail. After the conviction of David Venables, 
The prosecution team said only two people had emptied the septic tank, one being David Venables himself, and very few people know it even existed. They also stated that if anybody else was responsible for Brenda Venables' death, they could not have known about the septic tank because it was in a secluded area. Brenda Venables' cause of death remains unknown due to the amount of extensive decomposition to the body. It took 40 years, but justice has finally been served. Mrs. Venables' name was added to her parents' gravestone, and the year of her death was noted as 1982. On the 9th of January, 1982, 33-year-old Lynette Dawson mysteriously vanished from her home in Bayview, an upper-class suburb situated on Sydney's northern beaches. A young and gentle mother devoted to her daughters, she disappeared without a trace, leaving behind not only her children, but also her husband, Chris, who was a former professional rugby player. Lynette's mother called her on the 8th of January, 1982, the last time they ever communicated. The following day, Lynette was supposed to meet her family at Northbridge Baths, but she never arrived. It wasn't until the 18th of February, 1982, almost a month and a half after Lynette vanished, that Chris finally reported his wife missing. A few eyebrows were definitely raised following Chris's apparent indifference or concern for his wife's well-being. He was questioned by the police, later revealing that tensions between the couple due to financial reasons may have prompted Lynette's unexplained departure. He also gave merit to the idea she may have simply run off to join a commune. With no objective evidence against Chris, however, no arrest would be made, and the search for Lynette continued. Chris Dawson's life story wasn't exactly like everyone else's, to say the least. After his rugby career ended, he found employment at Cromer High School, where he served as a physical education teacher. Almost immediately, Reports about Chris's inappropriate behavior around pupils began to circulate, particularly with the student named Joanne Curtis. He later invited Joanne Curtis to move into his family home to work as a babysitter. A year after his wife's disappearance, Chris finalized divorce proceedings against Lynette before remarrying almost immediately, taking now 18-year-old Joanne as his second wife. They later moved from Sydney to Queensland, where they had another daughter, Kristen. The New South Wales police conducted investigations regarding Lynn's case, but were unable to come to a conclusion. As a result, the New South Wales state coroner held two coronal inquiries, the first of which was in February of 2001, almost 20 years after Lynn's disappearance. It was at this very inquiry where it was ruled by the deputy state coroner that Lynette couldn't have left her family or her daughters of her own volition, expressing a strong belief that she may have been murdered, quite possibly by someone she was well acquainted with personally. The coroner suggested filing charges, but the New South Wales Director of Public Prosecutions at the time, Nicholas Cowdery, said there wasn't enough proof for conviction. The second inquiry, conducted in February 2003, likewise advocated that Chris be prosecuted for Lynette's death. Despite this, Cowdery once again opted not to move forward with prosecuting Dawson due to a lack of evidence. Fifteen years later, in April 2018, after conducting multiple investigations, New South Wales Police once again asked the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions to analyze Lynn's case. As a result, Chris was apprehended in Queensland almost eight months later in December and accused of being involved in his first wife's alleged death. After qualifying for bail, he entered into a non-guilty plea for Lynn's murder in June 2019. Chris stood trial for his wife's murder in February 2020. He also faced charges due to his sexual involvement with Joanne while he was still a teacher at Cromer High School. Chris requested his case be moved to a later timeline 
on the basis that members of the jury could have prejudged his guilt. The claim was due to the widespread publicity of his case following its portrayal in the hit crime podcast series, The Teacher's Pet, which was hosted by journalist Hedley Thomas. The series featured a large amount of alleged damning evidence, most of which was overlooked or simply not found by previous police investigations. During the podcast, Thomas questioned the authenticity of Chris's story behind Lynn's disappearance. Thomas observed how weird it was for someone intending to never see their family again to leave behind an almost complete wardrobe, not even packing any suitcases or bothering to bring their contact lenses. He emphasized that Lynn had no job lined up, no car, and hardly any money. What he found most bizarre about Chris's statements, however, was that he claimed Lynn contacted him numerous times, which was quite peculiar considering she didn't contact anyone but her former husband, the same man who had allegedly betrayed and humiliated her. The podcast generated a lot of public outrage and controversy around the case. However, due to the ongoing legal proceedings, it was not made available in Australia. As a result, Chris's trial was rescheduled to allow hyperinflated publicity to die down. Chris was not content with this decision. His lawyer argued in May 2022 that the extensive pretrial publicity meant no jury was suitable to determine his guilt or innocence. Dawson's request for a judge alone trial was later granted approval. His new trial lasted for more than two months, beginning on the 9th of May and concluding on July 11, 2022. The prosecution's case against Chris Dawson was mostly based on circumstantial evidence, alleging that his motive for murdering his wife so that he could have a relationship unfettered by marriage. The defense team conceded that Dawson might have let his wife down in some way, but argued that the decision to abandon her family was made solely on Lynette's part. They further suggested that she might have created an entirely new life somewhere else. To support their position, the defense called upon many witnesses who all swore under oath they seen or interacted with Lynette after her alleged demise more than two decades ago. Chris himself, however, decided not to take the stand or offer any testimony during the trial. The authenticity of his claims was compromised, however, when it became subject to much debate after Joanne, his former lover and wife, took to the stand and announced to the judge how he mistreated her and enforced arduous labor on the then 18-year-old teenager, such as being made to take care of house cleaning, cooking, and caring for Chris's children. Joanne said that in October 1980, Chris offered to let her reside with him, his wife, and their two young daughters so she could finish earning her high school certificate in a serene environment, promising shelter from her then abusive father. She detailed how when she started cohabitating with the couple, Chris seemed removed from his wife and would often concoct various alcoholic drinks to put her to sleep. A month and a half later, on the 30th of August, 2022, a verdict was reached and Chris Dawson was found guilty. The rationale for this decision was that it was discovered Chris had lied multiple times about many things, including the nature of his early relationship with Joanne, his alleged willingness to rekindle his marriage with his missing wife, and his claims of talking to Lynette by phone on numerous occasions after she vanished, claims which were later proven to be unfounded. Moreover, the judge rejected any purported sightings of his wife as entirely fallacious, and, after reviewing the evidence, the judge rejected the idea that Lynette Dawson willingly left her family altogether. By the end, it was ruled with undeniable certainty that Lynette Dawson's life was cut short because Chris Dawson took deliberate and malicious action to make it so. As of this video, 73-year-old Chris remains in Silverwater Prison where he awaits his sentence hearing. Teresa Caroline Philogem, 
was a teenager who came to live with her sister in Tampa, Florida in 1980 on the condition that she would find a job. However, in May 1980, just one week from her 17th birthday, Teresa mysteriously vanished after heading out for a job interview. She was later reported missing by her sister, Margaret Johns, on May 16, 1980. About six months later, in December 1980, a convicted sex offender named William Mansfield Jr. was arrested in Nevada along with his brother, Gary Mansfield. They were both charged with the sexual abuse and murder of a 29-year-old California mother of three before leaving her lifeless body in a ditch. At the time, Billy Mansfield was known for his violent tendencies, particularly his proclivities for sexual abuse. Since the 70s, Billy has been in and out of prison numerous times on several counts of sexual assault. The last of his prison stay-ins was cut short after a few months when he lent his testimony against a cellmate. The charges against Billy's brother regarding the murder of the 29-year-old woman were later dropped after he agreed to cooperate with law enforcement. On March 16, 1981, the Hernando County Sheriff's Office acquired a search warrant permitting the department to excavate Mansfield's family home in Spring Hill. Said warrant was given to the department following statements made by an anonymous informant, likely Gary, Billy's brother, declaring that there were numerous bodies all buried and hidden throughout the estate. On March 17th, after much digging and searching, the authorities discovered several bones and what appeared to be a human skull buried in an unmarked grave. Suspicions that they might be Teresa's started to surface because they seemed to belong to a woman under the age of 20. Further examination revealed that the body was that of 15-year-old Elaine Louise Zegler. Elaine went missing on December 31, 1975, while vacationing with her mother Betty and stepfather Blaine Chalker at a KOA, Campgrounds of America campground, near Brooksville, Ohio. She was last seen on her way to the communal showers, where she was spotted conversing with a male in his 20s near the showers before getting into his car, a blue 1966 Ford Fairlane bearing Florida number plates. Her parents notified authorities when she did not return the next day. Jewelry was eventually unearthed, but it did not belong to Elaine. Beginning to suspect the possibility of more bodies, the authorities continued with the excavations. Additional Tampa police officers and metal detecting specialists were enlisted to help during the ensuing weeks. The detectives conducted ongoing searches with different degrees of success, initially finding little more than the bones of farm animals like cows and chickens. Then, on March 24th, a small bag of skeletal remains was discovered beneath a fireplace. Encouraged by this finding, many electrical cables and water pipes in the Mansfield home were dug and plowed by investigators, unearthing an assortment of human bones and personal belongings. When it was all over, three more skeletons, all of which belonged to young women, were discovered. Sandra Jean Graham a 21-year-old Tampa resident and worker at Hillsborough Community College was promptly identified as one of the bodies. On April 27, 1980, Sandra and a man witnesses referred to as a biker were last seen in a parking lot next to a bar. Witnesses recalled how she left many personal belongings at the bar before her disappearance, such as her car keys and sunglasses. The decomposing body of Sandra was discovered in a shallow grave on the Mansfield family's debris strewn five acre property and was identified through forensic dentistry. As for the other two bodies, police were not able to identify them and thus were registered as Jane Doe's. The unidentified skulls of the two women were later sent to Colorado State University for reconstruction, but no records matched their features. After maintaining his innocence for a while, Mansfield was tried, convicted, and handed four life sentences in 1982 after pleading guilty to escape the death penalty. It was reported that he couldn't cooperate with law enforcement 
or provide any sort of information that may lead investigators to the identity of his other two victims, as he didn't seem to recall who they were and had disposed of most of their belongings. He is currently serving time in a California prison. With nowhere else to look and no other potential leads, Teresa's case went cold. In 2021, more than 40 years after Teresa's mysterious vanishing, Significant developments in DNA testing and facial reconstruction gave cold-cased investigators new hope of finally putting Teresa's case to rest once and for all. After her sister, Margaret, received a call from the Hernando County Sheriff's Office, an officer arrived to take a DNA sample and establish a timeline. The goal was to utilize a process known as snapshot DNA phenotyping, which creates a visual representation of what a person looks like rather than simply searching for a genetic match. Individual predictions were eventually made for the victim's ancestry, eye color, hair color, skin color, freckling, and face shape, which all lined up with Margaret's sample. Six weeks after her initial contact with law enforcement, Margaret got the call. The results came back positive. One of the two Jane Doe's found on Mansfield's property was, without question, Teresa. While her sister was glad Teresa's remains were finally uncovered, this revelation was bittersweet, as both their parents died without ever knowing what happened to her. Mansfield's last unknown victim remains unidentified to this day. Janet Yeary In 2004, 51-year-old Janet Yeary lived in Kokomo, Indiana, and had worked as a lab manager for CMB Optical One for the past 16 years. She loved being outdoors, listening to music, and spending time with her granddaughter. On Wednesday, November 24, 2004, she began preparation for Thanksgiving dinner. That night, her daughter, Carly Martin, who lived across the street from her, spoke to Janet on the phone, and they discussed plans for their early dinner the following day. Dinner time came and went, though Janet never showed up. Carly repeatedly called her mother to see where she was, but got no answer. The following day, when she still hadn't heard from Janet, she walked across the street to check on her. Carly grew even more concerned when she realized that the garage door was left open, and when she entered the home, she discovered that her mother had begun cooking that day, but never finished, and the turkey was even still in the oven. She ended up finding her mother dead after being beaten and stabbed. There was no sign of forced entry into the home, so police theorized that, while Janet did not know her killer, she had willingly let them into her home for some reason. According to witnesses, a white vehicle was seen speeding away from the area on the night that Janet was killed. Investigators immediately suspected a man named Danny Case who was allegedly dropped off in Janet's neighborhood the night before Thanksgiving and went door to door looking for a ride home. At the time of the murder, Case was wanted in another county for a charge of attempted murder. He was arrested for this charge at the Indianapolis International Airport two months later, but he committed suicide in the airport holding cell before police could get any information from him. Police looked through some of the items that Case had with him and discovered that there was blood on many of them, but there wasn't enough to get a good DNA sample. While police still believed that Case was the perpetrator, Janet's daughter, Carly, wasn't convinced. However, there wasn't enough evidence to definitively link him and no new leads came in, so the case went cold for nearly two decades. The next break came when a friend of Case told police that he had once confessed the murder to him, allegedly, Case told him that he had killed a woman who lived on the same street that Janet did. Apparently, Case had knocked on Janet's door to ask about borrowing her phone to call for a ride home. According to this friend, Case had also confessed to killing an elderly man in a nearby county. Once they learned this, police went and spoke to Janet's surviving family. They were told about Case's friend's confession and allowed police to close Janet's case with exceptional clearance since the suspect was deceased. Pamela Graddick. On August 14, 2012, 26-year-old teacher's assistant, Pamela Graddick, was reported missing by her sister. 
She was last seen alive on Saturday, August 11, 2012, when surveillance footage caught her walking back to her apartment in the Bronx after a night out with friends. 11 days later, police still didn't have any leads, so Pamela's sister posted a plea on Facebook for any information on Pamela's whereabouts, but nothing new came from this. The following Tuesday, police in Yonkers, 10 miles from the Bronx where Pamela lived, responded to multiple calls about a suspicious garbage bag that had a strong smell coming from it. According to local residents, the area was a quiet, middle-class neighborhood and nobody expected would be uncovered. Inside the garbage bag, police found a human body wearing only a t-shirt and underwear wrapped in a red comforter, and the following day, an autopsy was performed. The body was determined to be that of Pamela Graddick, and a medical examiner revealed that she had been killed by two gunshot wounds to the head. Early on in the investigation, police suspected Pamela's girlfriend, Wanda Vegoia, but they did not have enough evidence to charge her, and they couldn't explain how such a petite woman could move Pamela's body to the wooded area to dump it. The Sunday before Pamela was reported missing, Wanda was allegedly in upstate New York at a family gathering where she stayed at her mother's house on Sunday night. On Monday morning, Pamela's family began to grow concerned when she didn't show up for work. Police worked on the case for two years until they reached a dead end. Though Wanda was cooperative with detectives, they still suspected her. Years later, when they still couldn't come up with any way to definitively link Wanda to the murder, the case was transferred to the Yonkers Police Department's cold case unit. According to detectives in this unit, everyone knew Pamela was a person of interest and they actively investigated anyone who had been in contact with her. Yonkers Police Department never gave up on Pamela's case and a $5,000 reward was posted for any information leading to a conviction in the case. But no new advancements came until nearly 10 years after the murder when Wanda allegedly confessed to police during an interview. According to police, she confessed that there had been an ongoing domestic issues between the couple and that she shot and killed Pamela inside of the apartment that they lived in with Wanda's children. She confessed that she got the gun from an acquaintance, 30-year-old John Torres, who she also called after the murder to get help moving the body. Begoia and Torres have been arraigned and are set to appear in court in the coming months. William Adams The last time that William T. Adams, also known as Cadillac Man, was seen alive was on August 25, 1992, when he spent the night at a homeless shelter in Missoula, Montana. On September 13, 1992, he was found dead in a nearby wooded area in a shallow grave with a broken knife still in his chest. Police believe that his body was dragged to this location since his jacket and sweater had been pulled up over his head. They also found two baseball caps and a bloody shirt at the scene. The blood didn't belong to William, so it was believed that the blood on his shirt came from the killer accidentally cutting their hand during the attack, but no suspect could be identified from the DNA. The case went cold for years until technology advanced enough to get a match from the blood sample. In 2019, Missoula Sheriff T.J. McDermott started a cold case division and it looked into the details of Williams' case again. In 2022, they found their DNA match. The suspect was identified as a man named Leonard Owen, also known as 8-Ball. Owen was also a transient in the area and he had an extensive criminal history, but he passed away before the identification was made. The police credit Owens' family and an association called Season of Justice for assisting them in making the match. Investigators have not yet released an explanation for why Owens killed William that day. Shelley Ray Kephart. On November 6, 1994, a pair of rabbit hunters found skeletal remains in a wooded area of Ottawa County, Michigan. The woman was estimated to be between 30 to 45 years old and had long, wavy, brownish auburn hair. 
She was suspected to have been between 5'6 and 5'10 and weighed around 160 pounds. Her race could not be determined for sure, but it was believed that she could be either Caucasian, Hispanic, or Native American. She seemed to have a distinct medical history, such as a healed fracture in her lower back, as well as previous surgery on her left knee. This surgery could have occurred as far back as 1980 and may have caused her to have a limp. She would have also been missing several teeth prior to her death. When her body was found, she was wearing black Stefano stretch pants in a size small, pink underwear with blue stripes in a size small, and blue cornerstone Gloria High heeled shoes in a size 6. Investigators believed that her body was likely disposed of that summer, and they suspected that her death could have been linked to an unidentified serial killer who had killed around 10 other women in rural West Michigan during the early to mid-1990s. However, a cause of death could not be determined. Reconstructions of the Jane Doe, who the police called Matilda, were released, but no promising leads came and the case went cold for decades. The next break in the case didn't come until this year, when the Ottawa County Sheriff's Department partnered with the DNA Doe Project. They were able to use genetic genealogy to identify this Jane Doe as Shelley Ray Kephart. Shelley was born on February 13, 1964, and lived in Minneapolis, Minnesota. In February of 1994, however, she was living in Grand Rapids, but she hadn't been seen by her loved ones in months. In October of 1993, her family reported her as missing, but her body wouldn't be found until nearly a year later, around 600 miles away from where her family reported her missing. Because of this, no connection was made between Shelley's missing person report and the Jane Doe, Matilda. According to the captain of the Ottawa County Sheriff's Investigative Division, Jake Sparks, Shelley had immediate family members, including her mother, siblings, and children that are still alive. He hopes that this identification means that they're one step closer to catching her killer and getting complete closure for her family and the community. Roxanne Lee Wood Roxanne Lee Wood's family and friends described her as an outgoing and fun to be around, and many of them told reporters and police that she was known for her beautiful smile and infectious laugh. She was extremely close with her sister, Janet, and she planned to soon start a family of her own with her husband, Terry. But in February of 1987, 30-year-old Roxanne Wood's bright future was cut short when she was found murdered in her own home. The evening of her death, she had gone out with her husband, Terry. The two of them first went to H.I.'s Old Town Saloon, then went bowling at White's Bowling Lanes. The two drove separately, and a little after midnight, Roxanne decided to go home early and meet Terry back at the house when he finished up. When Terry arrived back at the house shortly after 1 a.m., he discovered Roxanne's dead body lying in a pool of blood. According to the medical examiner, her throat was slit and she'd been hit over the head with a frying pan. There was no evidence of a struggle or forced entry into the home. The sheath of a knife was located near her body, but the murder weapon suspected to be a fillet knife based on the autopsy, was never recovered. Because the murder and assault weapon seemingly came from the home and due to the lack of forced entry, police initially suspected Roxanne's husband, Terry, to be the killer. His initial interview with police was cut short when his family hired an attorney, and he hasn't shared much with police or reporters since then. Terry remained a prime suspect in the murders for the next 25 years even though investigators found DNA on Roxanne's body that was not a match to his. In spite of this, since forensic options at the time weren't as advanced and not much could be done with the DNA collected, 35 years passed with no answers as to who killed Roxanne. In August of 2020, investigators took another look at the case. Michigan State Police went through over 3,000 pages of information about Roxanne's case and conducted new interviews with those involved in hopes of getting some new information to go off. Police also teamed up with the cold case program at West Michigan University, handling over the details and records of the case and letting the students put a fresh set of eyes on it. 
and their persistence paid off. In March of 2022, just days before the 35th anniversary of Roxanne's death, police arrested 67-year-old Patrick Wayne Gillum on murder charges. Ultimately, it was the DNA found on Roxanne's body, tested by Gabriela Vargas of Identifiers International Labs and a Michigan State Police Forensic Laboratory that led to Gillum's identification and eventual arrest. At this point, police are unsure of a motive for Roxanne's murder, and they believe that, though Gillum lived only four miles away from Roxanne's house, the two had no connection to each other at the time of the murder. Patrick Gillum, who was living in Indiana at the time of his arrest, was charged with the second-degree murder of Roxanne Wood and originally pleaded no contest to the charge. He later reached an agreement where prosecutors, who took into account input from Roxanne's family and husband, Gillum then pled guilty, accepting a deal that would keep him in prison for at least the next 23 years. He was formally sentenced on April 25th in a courtroom full of Roxanne's surviving family and friends. Michigan State Police also released a photo of Patrick Gillum from the year of the murder, 1987, so the public can get an idea of what he looked like at the time. They're hoping this photo will encourage some members of the public to come forward if they know any information about other unsolved crimes that Gillum may have committed. Roxanne's family and husband Terry can now breathe a sigh of relief and begin their healing process knowing that her killer is identified and behind bars and the suspicions that Terry may have been involved in his wife's death can finally be dispelled. I-65 Killer In 1987, 41-year-old Vicki Heath was recently engaged and had just moved into a home with her fiancé. She had an adult son and daughter and, in an effort to make some extra money, she began working at a Super 8 motel in Elizabethtown, Kentucky, right off Interstate 65. In the early morning hours of February 21st, 1987, Vicky was working the overnight shift at the motel. It had been a normal shift. The motel was about half full, and her manager had last spoken to Vicky around 11 p.m. when he left for the night. But shortly before 7 a.m., a guest called 911, telling the operator that he found the lobby a complete mess in total disarray. When he went downstairs to check out and no one was at the front desk, initially, based on the scene, officers believed that there had been a fight. There were items knocked over, furniture overturned, and a payphone ripped from the wall. But when police went outside to investigate more, it didn't take them long to realize what had actually happened. At around 7.30 a.m., homicide detectives were called to the scene. A body had been found. It was a female, lying on her back, wearing a torn and muddy sweater and plaid skirt. There were a set of muddy footprints that led away from her body to the parking lot, and they ended when a set of tire tracks began. That day, an autopsy was performed. The body was Vicky's, and she had been beaten, sexually assaulted, and shot in the head with a 38 caliber handgun. Luckily, one of the bullets that killed Vicky had gotten lodged in the ground and could be collected as evidence. They also collected her clothes and DNA from the crime scene as evidence, but they were unable to gather much from the photos of the footprints and tire tracks, as the snowfall was so light and had mostly melted when the sun rose. Elizabeth PD was asked about the case just days after. They admitted that they had no suspects, but they did believe it was nothing more than a robbery gone wrong after Vicky put up a fight. They were certain that this crime was just a one-off, but EPD couldn't have been more wrong. Margaret Gill, known to her friends and family as Peggy, was a 24-year-old college student who was working as a night auditor at a local Days Inn in Indiana, just off I-65. She took the job to help pay for school, but in her free time, she was known to be a passionate baker and cross-stitcher as she was described as soft-spoken, quiet, and shy, preferring the 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. shift since it was a bit less hectic. At 12.30 a.m. on March 3rd, 1989, Peggy spoke to her manager on the phone, describing the uneventful evening, but she failed to call her manager again at 5 a.m., which was protocol for safety reasons. The manager found this suspicious, saying, if it had been a different clerk, I wouldn't have thought much of it, 
but it wasn't like Peggy to miss a call. At exactly 5.51 a.m., the manager called Maryville Police Department to report Peggy missing. A couple of officers arrived at the scene just after 6 a.m., where they were met with some guests attempting to check out, reporting that no one was at the front desk. Peggy's car was still parked in the parking lot, her purse and keys were located behind the desk, and the lobby was pretty intact with no sign of a struggle. Because of this, when other officers began to arrive at the scene, they decided to hold off on containing the area as a crime scene. They did find that money was missing from the cash register, but nothing else was out of the ordinary. Police believed this was a misunderstanding, that they would soon find Peggy nearby, safe and unharmed. But when Maryville PD began investigating the hotel more, they found Peggy's body at the very end of a vacant hallway by a fire exit. She had been sexually assaulted and shot behind her left ear with a 22 pistol, and her uniform was found next to her body, neatly folded. Police lifted fingerprints from the cash drawer and desk, but they didn't match anyone with previous arrest records or any former guests or employees of the hotel. However, police soon learned that just 52 miles southbound of I-65, another night shift worker at a day's end was reported missing. About an hour after Peggy's body was discovered, this other woman, 34-year-old Janine Marie Gilbert, was found dead. Janine was a mother of two and recent divorcee who wanted a better life for herself and her children. She had recently enrolled at a local college and worked two jobs, bookkeeping during the day and part-time night auditing at the Remington Days Inn. Janine wasn't originally supposed to work the night of March 2, 1989, but she swapped shifts with another co-worker so she could attend the final high school game her daughter would be a cheerleader in. That night, Janine was getting some schoolwork done. At around 4.30 a.m., she made a wake-up call to a guest. Then, at around 5.30 a.m., just after sunrise, a nearby farmer calls police to report hearing two quick gunshots. Shortly before 6 a.m., multiple guests report to the police that they're attempting to check out of the hotel but are unable to find the clerk. About 30 minutes later, another farmer calls the police. He had found the body of a woman in a frozen ditch 20 miles from the hotel. She was wearing nothing except for her socks and shoes, rings and earrings, and she was shot three times in the back of her head with a 22 caliber gun. Pretty soon after the bodies were discovered, the Indiana State Crime Lab determined that the same gun was used in the death of Peggy and Janine, but they didn't link Vicky's death until decades later. In 2008, Elizabethtown police detective Clinton Turner submitted a DNA sample from Vicky's Heath crime scene. This alerted him that the sample matched DNA found at the two other scenes and, when placed on a map, all of the attacks lined Interstate 65, which led to the offender being dubbed the I-65 killer. They also attributed another reported crime to the same perpetrator. In January of 1990, an unidentified night auditor at another day's inn in Columbus, Indiana, was sexually assaulted. She gave a description of the man, and a composite sketch was created. He was six feet tall with greasy hair, green eyes, and right lazy eye. But even once investigators had linked the three murders and included the eyewitness description of the suspect, this would be a long road. It wasn't until 2022, three decades after the murders, that the DNA was able to be used in genetic genealogy investigation. ISP requested the help of the FBI, who matched DNA samples from the crime scenes to Kentucky native Harry Edward Greenwell. According to Sergeant Glenn Fifield of the Indiana State Police, the DNA match was 99.9999% positive. Greenwell died of cancer at the age of 68 in Iowa in 2013. According to ISP, he had an extensive criminal history ranging from the years 1963 to 1998. Even though he will never receive justice in the form of a prison sentence, the victim's remaining family members say that just knowing his identity is enough for them to begin their last stages of healing. Diane Dawn in 1988, Diane Dawn was 29 years old and living in Santee, California. 
just north of San Diego. She was described by her sister to be a great mother, and lots of friends and family members described her as a goofy, funny person. She was also a talented musician, known to play the violin and the guitar, and she loved to draw. But on May 2, 1988, when she didn't show up for work at the San Diego Transit Corp, her co-workers found it strange and decided to visit her home to check on her. Diane's body was found by this co-worker, bludgeoned and stabbed to death, and her two-year-old son was found unharmed, wandering around the apartment. Police began an extensive investigation right away to catch her killer, but little was uncovered, and for the next 34 years, her murder would remain unsolved. After the murder, Diane's son Mark was adopted by a family friend, but visited his biological family as often as possible. Even though he was only a toddler, he still, of course, struggled with the loss of his mother. Looking back, some of the struggles you go through is you feel alone because of what you went through. You lost your mother, he told police. You know you have family. You know you have family who loves you. But sometimes you do feel alone all the time. In the early 2000s, after decades passed with no answers, the investigation was reopened but hit another brick wall. The FBI took DNA found under Diane's fingernails and ran it through CODIS, a multi-agency collective database for offender DNA, but a match couldn't be made and the DNA sample was determined to be insufficient. Then, in 2010, investigators tried again. They took DNA from a hair that was found in Diane's hand after the attack. It matched the profile of the DNA found under her fingernails, but there were still no identifications made when it was ran through CODIS. Investigators and Diane's family began to feel discouraged. Would Diane Don's murderer ever face justice, and would they ever get the closure they'd been seeking? It wasn't until 2020 that there would be a significant break in the case. Through the use of genetic genealogy, investigators were finally able to make a DNA match and it tied to Warren Robertson. Genetic genealogists used Robertson's DNA profile to create nine family trees consisting of nearly 1,300 people who were related to him either by blood or marriage. From there, direct relatives were able to provide their DNA samples to definitively prove a relationship to Robertson. Warren was a tow truck driver who was born in Arkansas and would have been 27 or 28 at the time of the murder, and he lived in the same apartment complex as Diane. Investigators weren't sure if Diane and Warren knew each other besides living in the same complex, but they did uncover that they were both race car enthusiasts who frequented some of the same events. They had even both visited the El Cajon Speedway the year Diane was killed. Aside from that connection, there doesn't appear to be any known motive for Warren to have killed Diane, much less in such a brutal way. Especially considering investigators claim that there was no evidence of sexual assault. Additionally, Warren did not have a suspicious criminal past. He'd previously been convicted of some low-level property crimes, but never for any violent offenses. These are questions that may never be answered and details we may never know. Robertson moved out of state to Indiana after the murder, where he died in a house fire in November of 1999 at the age of 39, allegedly from smoke inhalation. But at least Diane's loved ones finally have a bit of closure, even if it was received 34 years later. Diane's now-grown son, Mark, said he was blown away that his mother's murder was solved after so long and with such a small piece of evidence and he applauded the advancements in technology that led to this discovery. He said, like how you go from what little information you have to building a case like that was truly impressive. The answers that my family received is closure, and closure is everything even after so much time had passed. Diane's sister, Victoria Dawn Minter, also spent her life fighting for answers in this case. When she was informed that Diane's murder was solved, she said, I didn't think anything was ever going to come of this. I thought I myself was going to go to my grave not knowing. Diane's case is one of five cold cases local to the San Diego area that have been solved using genetic genealogy in the past years. 
Patricia Lorraine Barnes. In August of 1995, human remains were found in a ditch on the side of the road in the state of Washington. The unidentified woman who had been shot twice in the head and she was found without clothes but covered partially by a sleeping bag. Her clothes were never found, but her pink hair curlers were discovered near where her body was left. The unidentified body was later identified by her fingerprints. Her name was Patricia Lorraine Barnes. Patricia was 61 years old at the time of her death, and she was last seen three days before her remains were found. She was believed to be homeless, a transient in the Seattle area who frequented nearby shelters. She was known by some as Towel Lady, since she often wore a towel or bandana around her head. But unfortunately, not many other details are known about her. Police collected 130 pieces of evidence from Patricia's body and the surrounding scene, including some cigarette butts, and they began their investigation by releasing a drawing of a man that, according to eyewitnesses, was the last person to be seen with Patricia before she went missing. However, nobody came forward with information about the man in this sketch, and the investigation soon came to a standstill. Police briefly suspected that serial killer Robert Lee Yates, also known as the Spokane serial murderer, may have been responsible for Patricia's death. Between the years of 1996 and 1998, he was known to have killed 11 women in the Spokane area, but he was ruled out as a suspect in this case after it was found that he was across the country in Alabama at the time of Patricia's murder. And with that, the investigation hit another dead end. But the case was reopened in 2018 after the Kitsap County Sheriff's Office, like many other law enforcement agencies, dedicated a division of their department to taking a second look at cold cases. They decided to send the evidence that was initially collected at the crime scene to the Washington State Crime Lab and two private forensic labs. And in 2021, Orthrum, one of the private labs, gave police the name of the match to the DNA on one of the cigarette butts that was discarded at the crime scene. Through the process of genetic genealogy, it was determined that the DNA belonged to then 33-year-old Douglas Keith Crony. Investigators noted that the collection of a wide variety of evidence from the crime scene really aided in the identification of the killer. Touch DNA belonging to someone else found on Patricia's body may not have been enough to tie that individual to her murder. It could have come from someone she lived with or encountered that day through completely normal circumstances. But the combined pieces of evidence all sharing the same DNA profile help eliminate any other explanations for the DNA being on her body. Kitsap County Sheriff's Office Detective Mike Grant said, the linchpin for the evidence was a cigarette butt that was found at the body dump location. The evidence on the body could mean one of two, three things, but when you have a cigarette butt with the DNA and the DNA on her body and on items around her body, it was conclusive to me that we had the right guy. But who was Douglas Keith Crony? How did he know Patricia? And most importantly, why would he kill her? Crony was living in Washington state at the time, spending his time between the cities of Seattle and Tacoma, and he had an extensive criminal record. He had five previous felony charges, including one for first-degree robbery in 1984 and second-degree kidnapping in 1994, the year before Patricia's murder. Crony's criminal record leads police to believe that he may be responsible for other unsolved cases, and they plan to use this DNA match to see if any more positive IDs can be made. According to Detective Mike Grant, they're still not sure how Patricia first came in contact with her killer, and he was never even a person of interest or name mentioned in the initial investigation. Grant said, How they connected or how they came to meet, nobody knows. Douglas is not mentioned in any other reports as an acquaintance or a witness or a person of interest. I went through all the other tips, diaries, and no one mentioned his name. I would suspect it was a purely random encounter. Douglas would never have the opportunity to be arrested for Patricia's murder, though. In 2016, when he was 54 years old and living in Nogales, Arizona, he died after being electrocuted 
while installing a TV antenna that hit a power line. Mike Grant, the lead detective for Kissap County Sheriff's Office, reached out to Patricia's surviving family members after this development in the case. He described their reactions as shocked and grateful that they now have some answers, even if they came 30 years later. Eve Wilkowitz In 1980, Eve Wilkowitz was on the verge of her 21st birthday and working as a secretary for a publishing company in New York City. The night of March 21st, she had gone to dinner and a movie after work with her boyfriend, Jack Dempsey. When she left his house a little after midnight, she took the train home from Manhattan to her Long Island apartment. In the early hours of March 23rd, when her roommate, Robert Grogan, noticed that Eve hadn't returned home in a while, he reported her missing. Chillingly, not long before her death, Eve told Robert that she felt she was being followed on her nightly walks back from the train station to her home. Because of this, she began taking a taxi from the train station rather than making the 10-minute walk alone. However, police believe that that night, for an unknown reason, Eve decided to walk home instead of calling a taxi. Three days after she was reported missing, her body was found on a lawn just three blocks from her apartment when a woman noticed a figure and a pair of bare feet on her neighbor's lawn. The body was identified as Eve's. She was only partially dressed and there were ligature marks on her wrist, suggesting that she had been bound, possibly during the days since her abduction, according to investigators. Her cause of death was found to be manual strangulation and there was evidence that she had been sexually assaulted. Bodily fluids that did not match Eve's DNA profile was taken as evidence and stored, but no DNA matches could be made immediately, and it would remain on evidence shelves for decades. Just months after Eve's death, two more young women will be found dead near train stations in Long Island, not far from where Eve's body was found. But no connections could be made, and no leads came from these other two deaths. 42 years passed with still no answers, but Eve's sister, Irene, never stopped fighting for justice the whole time. Irene stayed on top of the police, emailing them every few weeks to inquire about updates on the status of the case. She also encouraged them to try new forensic techniques using the DNA evidence collected, since she'd seen the way so many cold cases were being solved in recent years through genetic genealogy. Irene's hard work and dedication paid off. Eventually, the FBI was able to use the DNA profile to identify the killer as Herbert Rice. The DNA was first linked to one of his sons, then Rice's body was exhumed and a sample of his bone was collected for comparison. Turns out, they were a match. Herbert Rice was Eve's killer. He was 29 years old at the time of the crime, and even though the investigation was thorough, with police canvassing the area and interviewing everyone on neighboring streets, Rice was never even suspected. Rice was never a person of interest in this case, mainly since he didn't have an extensive criminal record, only a few misdemeanors, so his DNA was never entered into any databases since he'd never been arrested for a violent offense. Police believe this was a crime of opportunity, as Rice lived on the block where the crime occurred. They also don't believe that Rice was responsible for any other murders before or after Eve's. Rice went on to have two sons that had no idea about their father's dark past, and he died from cancer in 1991. Although he never faced legal justice for what he did to Eve, his identification put her family's nerves at ease. Irene spent most of her life in fear that she would be killed next. She was scared to follow her dreams for fear of being murdered just like her sister. And now, with the understanding of what happened and the death of Herbert Rice, Irene and her son Evan, who was named in honor of his aunt Eve, are able to breathe a sigh of relief. Irene was beside herself with happiness that this day finally came. She told reporters, I still can't believe I heard those words. We have identified the person responsible for the death of Eve. Sophie Sergi. Sophie Sergi was born in 1973 in rural Pitka's Point, Alaska, which was a territory of the Yup Ik people and sits along the Yukon River. Sophie's initial dream was to join the Navy, 
but since she stood at only four foot nine, she didn't qualify for her desired position. Instead, she decided to attend college and study marine biology, since she loved whales and wanted to work with them. She was the first in her family to attend college, set on building a better life for herself and her family. Sophie got a scholarship to the University of Alaska Fairbanks, and the move was quite the culture shock for her. The university was a five-hour flight from her village and much more urban than her hometown. She found comfort within the Rural Student Services organization, where she met a friend, Shirley Wassily. In 1992, Sophie took a leave from school to receive jaw surgery and orthodontic work for her overbite. But since she had to work at a job in Pitka's Point to receive their health insurance, she would board a flight every few months back to Fairbanks for her treatment and appointments. Her friend Shirley had a dorm on a girls only floor at UAF's campus, so Sophie would stay there when she was in Fairbanks to save money. And on April 24th, 1993, they did just that. It was a Saturday, and Shirley and Sophie had lunch, ran some errands, and hung out at the dorm. By Sunday, Shirley was preparing for final exams and did some schoolwork. According to Shirley, Sophie had plans to attend a movie with some friends. That night, after Sophie went to the movie and Shirley did some studying, they met up at the dorm where Shirley's boyfriend, Noah, ordered pizza for the group. By around 1 a.m., they decided to call it a night. As was usual when Sophie stayed over, Shirley gave her the dorm to herself while she stayed in Noah's dorm. Before Shirley and Noah left, Sophie asked if there was anywhere she could go to smoke a cigarette. That night, it was below freezing, so Shirley told Sophie that she can go to the bathroom down the hall since it had vents to suck up the smoke. And with that, Shirley and Noah headed out. Shirley noted that there were a few people still in the hallway, including a man she didn't recognize. She locked eyes with him, but wouldn't realize who he was until decades later. On the morning of April 26, Shirley returned to her dorm. She was, admittedly, a bit annoyed finding the door unlocked, the bed still made, and the TV and lights still on. She assumed that Sophie had already gotten up and ready for the day. She went to the shared bathroom located on that floor and called out to the closed shower stalls. Sophie, are you here? Someone responded, yeah, I'm here. Shirley accepted that response, took a shower, and returned to her dorm, leaving a note for Sophie to give her a call later that day. But when Shirley got home, Everything was where she left it, and Sophie had not contacted her. This was when Shirley got worried, asking around to see if anyone had seen Sophie. Shirley even called Sophie's orthodontist that she had an appointment for, but they informed her that Sophie never showed up. While this was happening, students around campus began chatting about a police presence at Bartlett Hall, the dorm building that Shirley lived in. By the time it reached Shirley, she heard everything she needed to know. A body had been found. Shirley rushed back to her building where she was stopped by police, who told her that she couldn't enter. She told the officer that she was looking for a friend, and they began asking questions. The officer followed Shirley and Noah into Shirley's dorm, asking questions along the way. One state trooper found Sophie's ID in the room and recognized her. She was the girl whose body they found in the bathroom. It was a female janitor who was cleaning the shower and bath area that discovered her body. When police arrived, they noticed she had been badly injured and the positioning of her clothing indicated that the crime was sexually motivated. Investigators began by interviewing everyone on the floor. Since Sophie's attack happened earlier in the hours of the morning, most students who were interviewed reported being in bed, therefore not seeing or hearing anything unusual. It was surprising that no one had witnessed a man exiting the bathroom on an all-female floor, which would certainly draw attention. But it turns out that wasn't all too unusual to see men in the bathrooms on all-female floors. Men who were partying at dorms on the all-female floors would sometimes use the bathrooms to avoid going up to the male-only floors. UAF had recently had some budget cuts, which led to diminished security measures in dorm halls, and there was no regulation of who was on each floor at any given time. Though investigators did everything they could to find Sophie's killer, years passed without answers until December of 2018. 
25 years after the murder, when investigators got a call from a genetic genealogist. They were told that they formed a profile from the DNA collected at the crime scene. They used the profile to trace a family tree until they identified a match. The killer was Stephen Harris Downs. The identification led investigators all the way to Maine, where 44-year-old Downs was arrested and charged with Sophie's murder. When Maine State Police and Alaska State Troopers interviewed Downs, they found out that in 1992, he was enrolled at UAF and lived in Bartlett Hall. He and his roommates had been interviewed when the body was initially found, and he reported that he didn't have any significant information. In 2019, he said the same thing, that he remembered a girl was murdered in his dorm building, but that he didn't know much else. According to Downs, he was staying on the fourth floor with his girlfriend that night, and he was adamant that he hadn't ever been on the second floor. He suggested that the killer might have been a soldier from nearby Fort Wainwright and that they were known to party in Bartlett Hall. Investigators needed a direct comparison to connect Downs to the case since he wasn't going to confess, but he never had any previous charges or convictions that would require him to submit DNA. So police executed a search warrant that included a cheek swab, and it was a match. And just like that, on February 15, 2019, Stephen Downs was charged with the first-degree murder and first-degree sexual assault of Sophie Sergey, and in February of 2022, after deliberating for 20 hours, a jury found Downs guilty of Sophie's murder. He will have a sentencing hearing on September 26th and 27th. Investigators don't believe that Downs knew Sophie before the murder. Lucille Holtgren 79-year-old Lucille Holtgren lived in Galt, California with her husband Frank for 25 years, and they were known to be extremely kind and welcoming. Lots of the neighborhood kids said that the couple would always have their doors open for them, offering them cookies and lemonade in the summer. Just a few months before Lucille's murder, Frank passed away due to Alzheimer's, but Lucille remained an active member at the First Methodist Church and in her local community. So when Lucille didn't attend church on May 22, 1988, her friends grew worried and decided to check on her. They entered her home through a sliding glass door that was found partially open and made a gruesome discovery. They found Lucille's dead body in her bedroom. She had been stabbed, strangled, and sexually assaulted, but there were no signs of forced entry into her home. Lucille's autopsy revealed that she had been dead for two to five days before her body was found. Multiple agencies were involved in the case. The Sacramento County Sheriff's Office collected evidence from the scene, and the California Department of Justice collected fingerprints. They tried everything they could, but the amount of DNA they collected was so small that there was not enough that could be done at the time, and the case eventually went cold. It wasn't until January of 2022 when the Sacramento County Crime Lab re-examined the DNA evidence collected that a match was finally made. They examined scrapings from under Lucille's fingernails and bodily fluids found on her bedding, and a match was made to Terry Leroy Bramble. Bramble was 32 years old at the time of the murder, and he was never a suspect on police radar. His DNA was on file in a database due to a sexual assault conviction from 1992. He was a transient in the Galt area for years, but he died of natural causes in October of 2011. At the time of his death, he was homeless living in the area under a bridge on Highway 99. Police say they are working with other nearby jurisdictions to determine whether Bramble may be responsible for other unsolved cases. Police still don't know what the motive may have been for Bramble to kill Lucille or if the two ever come in contact with each other. But Lucille's surviving son, who was now the age that his mom was when she died, says that just knowing the identity of who killed his mother is enough closure after 34 years. Lee Rotatori. Lee was born on September 29, 1949 in North Dakota. She was the oldest of four siblings and grew up all throughout the Midwestern United States. As a child, she loved art and horses, and as an adult, she was finally able to have a horse of her own. She received a bachelor's degree in dietary services from the University of Wisconsin and went on to get a master's degree in food and nutrition. On November 14, 1970, 
she married Anthony Rotatori, and they went on to have a son named Michael. In 1977, the couple got a divorce, and Michael lived in Chicago with his dad. Lee went on to marry a man named Gerald Jerry Nimke in August of 1978, but she kept her last name from her first marriage to Anthony. Lee and Jerry got a divorce in 1979, but remarried in December of 1981. In 1982, Lee moved to Council Bluffs, Iowa for a job as a food service director at a hospital. When she first arrived in Council Bluffs, she checked into room 106 at a Best Western Motel, where she planned to stay until Jerry met her there with their mobile home. On Monday, June 21st, Lee began orientation for her new job. That Thursday, she went boating with some friends she met at work. In the evening, they left the lake, stopped at McDonald's, then Lee headed back to the motel. The next day, Friday the 25th, a motel employee found Lee in her room, lying on her bed, dead. It appeared that she'd been deceased for about 12 hours before she was found, and she had a single stab wound. There were no signs of forced entry into the room, and there didn't appear to be a struggle. But investigators did find evidence that Lee had been sexually assaulted. One of the detectives on the case told the public that some items had been stolen from Lee's motel room, such as her purse and jewelry, but he informed that police did not believe robbery was the motive. Since the motel was located right off two large interstates and around 12 hours had passed since the crime had occurred, investigators realized that the perpetrator could be anywhere by now. Police's first suspect was Lee's husband, Jerry, because of his criminal record. In 1960, when Jerry was 17 years old, he was arrested in Chicago and questioned about the killing of three women and fatal beating of another woman. When he was apprehended for questioning in the beating, he was driving a stolen car. He admitted to the attack and ended up being convicted and sentenced to death. Not even two years later, the Illinois Supreme Court ended up overturning his conviction due to a technicality in the way his preliminary hearing was conducted. He was tried again and sentenced to 75 years, but it's unclear how he ended up being released. In spite of this, police claimed that Jerry had a solid alibi for the night of Lee's death and he was ruled out as a suspect. The hospital that Lee had just begun work at and the Best Western where she was both staying, both donated $1,000 for reward for anyone who could give information that would lead to her killer but the case went cold. In 2001, investigators submitted the evidence collected at the crime scene to the Iowa Division of Criminal Investigation Lab to take another look. They identified a male DNA profile, but it didn't match anyone in any databases. Over the next few years, they would continue to test this DNA against the samples and databases, but no matches were made. In 2018, Council Bluffs Police submitted the DNA to Parabon, figuring that the only way they could solve the case after so many years would be through genetic genealogy. By early 2021, they had made a match to the DNA. It belonged to Thomas Freeman. Lab then analyzed a sample from DNA from Freeman's daughter to confirm this, and they found that there was a parent-child relationship between the DNA from the crime scene and the DNA from Freeman's daughter. In the February of 2022, the Council Bluffs Police Department announced their findings. Only four months after Lee's death, 35-year-old Freeman's body was found in a shallow grave in Illinois. It seemed that he had been there for about three months before he was discovered, and he had sustained multiple gunshot wounds. His killer was never identified, but police are reinvestigating it to see if it has any potential connections to Lee's murder. Lee's husband, Jerry, died in 2019, before he ever found out who killed his wife. Lisa Fracassi. Lisa Fracassi was born in New Jersey in 1958, and she had dreams of becoming a nurse. One of her friends, Renee, told a news outlet she was a caring person, like a nurse, who would sit for hours with people who needed help. In 1987, she was living in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and working in a hospital. One night, she was driving with a 49-year-old man and had her first and only run-in with the law. They were pulled over by police for a broken tag light, but Lisa was arrested since she was also driving with a suspended license. While the police were arresting her, 
they noticed cocaine residue in the vehicle and searched the car, finding 1.5 kilos of cocaine and 28 grams of marijuana. Because of this, she was also charged with possession of cocaine, possession of cocaine with intent to sell, felony possession of marijuana, possession of drug paraphernalia, and trafficking cocaine in excess of 400 grams. By 1990, it seemed like Lisa had put this incident behind her. She moved to Hawaii and began working as an exotic dancer in an effort to make enough money to put herself through nursing school. In the beginning of October 1994, she had just broken up with her boyfriend. They had dated for about seven months before their breakup, and he worked as a police officer for the Honolulu Police Department. According to Lisa's closest friend, Renee, she remained friendly with him, and it was by no means a bad breakup. By the end of the month, Lisa had started seeing someone new. On Wednesday, October 27th, Lisa didn't show up for work, and co-workers became worried when she also doesn't show up the following Thursday and Friday. In an interview with police, Lisa's boss said that on Friday she called him and told him that she was quitting and had plans to work for another club. But the next day, Saturday the 30th, she called him back and asked if she could come in to work. She worked that night until 2 a.m., which would be the last time she was seen alive. She was scheduled to work Tuesday, but never showed up. Her boss called her to check in, but she didn't answer. He called again on Wednesday and Thursday, when she still didn't show up for work, but again, he got no response. That Thursday, the housekeeper at the hotel Lisa was living in stopped by her room to drop off clean linens, but there was a Do Not Disturb sign hanging on her door handle. Hotel staff reported that they seen this sign on her door for days in a row at this point, since that past Saturday. The housekeeper knocked on the door and received no response. Since the Do Not Disturb sign had been there so long, she entered the room. That's when she discovered Lisa's bruised body. The medical examiner determined that she had likely been deceased for four days when she was found and died as a result of strangulation. From there, investigators got to work to find her killer. Lisa's ex-boyfriend was given a polygraph test, which he passed. The police collected some evidence from the scene, and luckily, just a year before in 1993, Honolulu police began using a new, more effective method of storing DNA. But after a while, the case went cold. The next development wasn't until the year 2000, when John Eric Armstrong, a sailor in the Navy, was suspected of Lisa's murder. He had been linked to the deaths of some sex workers in the 90s when he was stationed around the country. The lead was promising, but he was ultimately ruled out as a suspect. The next development in the case happened in 2016, when the Honolulu Police Department set up a cold case unit called the Aoli Ponya Project, which means never forgotten. In March of 2020, HPD took another look at the fingerprints and DNA taken from the crime scene. They sent the DNA to Parabon Nano Labs to try and get a snapshot of what the perpetrator may look like based on his DNA. When this happened, well-known genetic genealogist C.C. Moore took a look at the case, and just like that, a DNA match was made. Cecil Trent was identified as a suspect. Cecil Trent was 29 years old when Lisa died. According to his family, Trent died from congestive heart failure in 2013 at the age of 48. At the time of his death, he still lived in Honolulu, and he had three children. After he died, his fingerprints were taken, and they matched the ones found at the crime scene. After confirming by fingerprint match and DNA match, this case was considered solved in April of 2022. Emma Caldwell In April 2005, 27-year-old Emma Caldwell was working as a sex worker in Glasgow's Red Light District. She had been struggling with drug addiction since her older sister passed away from cancer. As a child, she loved horses and was known to be kind and considerate. Her family called her Emmy J, short for Emma Jane. She was last seen alive in the early morning hours of April 5th, and her loved ones reported her missing five days later. On May 8th, her body was found in the woods, 40 miles from where she was last seen. She was found without clothes, and she had been strangled. A woman named Anna Wallace runs a support group in Glasgow named Salt and Light. The group acts as a support system for people 
including sex workers, who are struggling in any way. Just days before her death, Emma had gone to Anna to speak about a troublesome customer who had been causing her to feel unsafe. Other sex workers who knew Emma reported that one man in particular, Ian Packer, was obsessed with her. Ian Packer was a regular client of Emma's, and he was on police radar early on due to his history of domestic violence and aggression towards women. At least four other sex workers in the area came forward to police and said that Ian had taken them to the same remote forest where Emma's body was found. He was interviewed six times between the years of 2005 and 2007, and he was always adamant he never hurt Emma, even saying that he's never hurt a woman in his life. And he was ultimately ruled out as there was not enough evidence to charge him with anything. Then, two years after Emma's death, police arrested and charged four Turkish men who were involved in a large-scale undercover operation. At 11.20 p.m., on April 4, 2005, the day that Emma was last seen alive, she received a phone call. The call lasted only 76 seconds, but it was traced to a Turkish man living in Glasgow by the name of Abu Bukir Onku. Around the time of Emma's disappearance, he had left Scotland to travel back to Turkey, which raised red flags for police. When he returned, police contacted him and he voluntarily gave interviews and provided DNA samples. Despite this, police bugged his house and interviewed a former girlfriend of Anku's, who said that he was controlling. Not long after Anku was interviewed, a sex worker in the area told police that she had been sexually assaulted by two men in a Turkish cafe in Glasgow, and that she knew two other women who had also been sexually assaulted there. Police followed these leads and fully turned their attention to Turkish men in the community. Detectives also uncovered that the last ping from Emma's phone was in the vicinity of that cafe. Police searched the cafe and conducted surveillance of it for the following months. In a promising lead, investigators tested a spot of blood on a quilt found in the cafe, and it was positively identified as belonging to Emma. However, this wasn't enough evidence to charge or convict anyone for Emma's death, and this promising trail ended up going cold. Investigators never gave up, though. In 2015, Police Scotland's major investigative team received instructions from the Lord Advocate, one of the senior law officers in Scotland, to dedicate more work to reinvestigating this case. And just this year, police original suspect Ian Packer, now 49 years old, was finally arrested and charged for the murder of Emma Caldwell. He is being accused of 38 charges in total, including some for sexual assault and abductions in unrelated cases. The judge denied his bail, and he did not plead, so he is expected to appear in court over the next few months, where we will learn more about the evidence police uncovered that led to this arrest. Linda Lanson and Barbara Graham 41-year-old Linda Lanson was a photographer from New York and a mother to her 7-year-old daughter. She had moved from New York to Tampa, Florida, where she was living with her niece, Linda. On the evening of July 10, 1983, she left her apartment for unknown reasons, but she never returned home. On July 11, 1983, her body was found by a jogger. She was partially clothed and was found in the bushes off a dead-end road with a gunshot wound to the head. The next day, her car was found abandoned on a residential street about 10 miles from where her body was found. Not long after this, her purse was found on the side of a road in Clearwater, Florida, a city about 20 miles outside of Tampa. One month later, in August of 1983, 19-year-old Barbara Grams was walking home from her job at the mall, but she never made it back. Her body was discovered on the 19th. She had been dumped behind a dentist's office in the Tampa Heights area. Lisa's first suspect in Barbara's case was a man named Robert Du Bois. He was 18 years old at the time of the murders, and a resident of the area passed his name on to police, saying that he caused problems in the neighborhood. Du Bois was questioned by police, and he agreed to let them take a dental mold to compare to a bite mark that was found on Barbara's cheek. The two bite marks were determined to be a match by forensic odontologist named Dr. Richard Souvenron. 
and he was charged and convicted for Barbara's murder. Dr. Suvin Rome gained notoriety just a decade earlier for his work on the Ted Bundy case, where he provided testimony about the bite marks found on Bundy's victims. Robert was initially sentenced to death, but in 1988, his sentence was reduced to life in prison plus 15 years. Robert denied any involvement in the murder and got in contact with the Innocence Project to help him fight this conviction. They were able to use DNA taken from Barbara after her body was found to compare to Robert's DNA, and it didn't match. Robert was exonerated and determined to be wrongfully convicted after spending 37 years in prison for Barbara's murder. It was later revealed that the mold taken of Robert's teeth was made using beeswax, which isn't an acceptable medium for dental molds. Additionally, Dr. Suvin Roan claimed that the suspect would have a missing front tooth or a gap between his teeth, two characteristics that Robert didn't have. To make matters worse, a separate dentist later examined Barbara's wound and determined that it was not even a bite mark at all. After this, the district attorney did some more investigating to determine who was actually responsible for Barbara's death. After doing some DNA testing, the DA realized that it was not one, but two men responsible for Barbara's murder, and that they were also responsible for many more crimes in the Tampa area in the 80s. DNA matches proved that 58-year-old Amos Robinson and 57-year-old Abron Scott were found to be responsible for the deaths of both Barbara Graham and Linda Lanson. Both of them are already serving life sentences for other unrelated murders, those of Herminia Castro and Carlos Orellana, which happened within months of Linda and Barbara's. Since he's been in prison, Robinson has killed two other inmates and is serving three life sentences for first and second degree murder, kidnapping, and robbery. Scott is serving one life sentence for first-degree murder, kidnapping, robbery, and burglary. Lindy Sue Beekler Lindy Sue Little was born on January 31, 1956, to her parents, Eleanor Giese and Wayne Little. Her parents separated when she was very young, but she lived with her mother, Eleanor, while her father, Wayne, remarried and had another child, Mike Little. Lindy was described as a free spirit by her half-brother, Mark, and he said that she had a great work ethic. Later in her high school years, Lindy was working at a flower shop and ended up meeting a man named Philip Beekler, who attended Millersville State College and worked for Hertz Rental Cars. Lindy and Philip ended up getting married in 1975 and moving into an apartment, 104A, in the Spring Manor apartment complex in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Not long after they moved into the apartment, Lindy began telling her friends and family that she had an uneasy feeling, like she was being watched and followed. One day, Lindy was home alone when she noticed a man looking through the sliding glass door in her apartment. Ever since this incident, Lindy was nervous to be home alone, especially at night. However, she got off work when it was still light out while her new husband, Philip, worked later into the evening, leaving Lindy home alone for a few hours, some in the darkness. On December 5th, 1975, Lindy got off work, visited Philip at his job, and then went to the Millersville Shopping Center to get some groceries. At around 7.15 p.m., she arrived at home and unloaded her groceries. She was supposed to be home alone for the rest of the night, but her family knew that made her uncomfortable. So her uncle Mel and aunt Celeste invited her to join them at a basketball game they were taking their kids to that night. At around 8.45 p.m., Mel and Celeste arrived at the apartment to pick up Lindy, and Celeste went up to the front door to get her. Celeste noticed that the front door was unlocked, which she found to be unusual. But as she entered the home, she found more things that weren't quite right. She found a lamp knocked over in the living room and couldn't find Lindy anywhere, even though she was calling her name. Once Celeste made it to the kitchen, she found a horrible scene. Lindy was laying on her back, dead. Celeste called 911, and police arrived soon after. 
They began investigating the crime scene and couldn't find anything of value missing from the home, so the motive of robbery was quickly ruled out. There was also no evidence that the crime was sexually motivated and there were no signs of forced entry into the home. There was evidence that Lindy had fought back desperately against her attacker and police found a male's bloody footprint in the kitchen. According to the autopsy, Lindy had been stabbed with two different knives. The butcher knife, which was used, came from her kitchen, but the other knife has never been found and police assumed that the killer brought it in himself. The medical examiner believed that the fatal stab occurred early on in the attack, but that the killer kept stabbing her in a fit of passion. Lindy's neighbors all had alibis for the time of her murder, so they were all ruled out as suspects, but that also meant that none of them had any leads or information to give police. By February 7th, police had interviewed at least 250 people, but they were no closer to having any solid suspects leads, or motives. Around the one-year anniversary of Lindy's death, her parents went to visit her gravesite when they found that her headstone had been vandalized. It was covered in red paint, and it had been chipped and carved into. It was the only gravestone in the cemetery that had been vandalized, so police believed that the incident was related to her murder. Though they investigated the incident, nothing came from it. A few weeks later, Police received a two-page anonymous letter marked Urgent. The letter was written in two parts. The first from someone who claimed to be the killer, and the second from someone named Janice Crum, who claimed to be a friend of the killer. Police did find someone by the name of Janice Crum who lived in the area, but she was never able to be linked to the crime. FBI profiler James Fitzgerald examined the letter and believed that Lindy's killer had an explosive temper and had major life changes after the crime, such as his life seeming to fall apart or becoming more devoted to his job or religion. He believed that the letter was sent to mislead the police or distract them from any leads they were currently following and that it was written by one person, not two. He believed that the author was left-handed and either a female or a male who was struggling with his sexual orientation. He also noted that it's unlikely that the killer was the author of the letter, but that he couldn't rule out that the author was somehow involved in the murder. The letter was eventually lost by police before any physical evidence could be taken from it. In 1982, police investigated the next suspect, mass murderer Gerald Eugene Stano. That year, he was arrested in Florida and confessed to killing nearly 40 women. His father lived near Lancaster, Pennsylvania at the time of Lindy's murder, but no leads came when police circulated Stano's picture around the area. Later that year, he was officially ruled out as a suspect. In 1984, the district attorney's office hired two psychics to help on the case. According to the psychics, Lindy's killer had an olive complexion with dark hair and dark eyes and a tattoo on his arm. Investigators believe this man may be Mark Capolupo. At the time of Lindy's murder, he would have been 18 years old and he previously been convicted of other violent crimes. He was shot and killed during a prison escape attempt in 1976 and he was ruled out of Lindy's murder as he was confirmed to be working at the time. Without any more leads, Lindy's case went cold until 2006 when it caught the attention of Vidoc Society a volunteer group of retired professionals in forensic-related fields that aims to put new eyes on cold cases. In 2019, the case seemed to get a bit closer to being solved. DNA found at the crime scene was used to create a snapshot picture of what the killer may have looked like at ages 25 and 65. It was determined that the killer's ethnicity was Southern European, possibly mixed with Middle Eastern, and that he had dark hair and hazel eyes. Just this year, an arrest was finally made. 68-year-old David Sinopoli was arrested and charged with the murder after DNA found on Lindsay's clothes was sent to Parabon Nanolabs for genetic genealogical testing. Investigators at Parabon identified Sinopoli as a suspect and gave his information to police, who then looked into him more. They found out that he had, 
at one point, lived in the same apartment complex that Lindy did at the time of her murder. Police were able to extract a sample of David's DNA from a coffee cup he threw away, and when they tested it against the DNA found at the crime scene, a match was made. Even though a DNA match was made, David is currently still being held without bond, awaiting a conviction. Christine McHorter and Beatrice Daniels In January 2009, 22-year-old Christine McWhorter and a 31-year-old aunt, Beatrice Daniels, were living in the Chestnut Terrace housing complex in Huntingdon County, Pennsylvania, with Christine's four-month-old daughter and four-year-old son. Christine had recently moved to the area to escape the violence and crime in Philadelphia, and she was attending college where she studied business. The night of January 2nd, the women were laying in bed with the children between them when they were both shot in the heads and killed with a 25 caliber gun. Luckily, Christine's children were left unharmed after the attack, and it was actually Christine's four-year-old son who left the apartment to alert neighbors and get help. Investigators collected blood samples from the stairs and doors inside the apartment and found DNA that belonged to an unidentified male. In 2016, the DNA was sent to Parabon Nanolabs, who created an image of what the killer may look like based on his DNA. According to this profile, the killer was a black man with green or hazel eyes and a light to medium skin tone. In 2018, the DNA was used to conduct genetic genealogy, and a man named Morico Johnson was identified as a potential suspect. He also matched the physical description released by Parabon. His name was handed over to police, who found out that Christine knew Morico's then-girlfriend, Cynthia Swan. In 2019, Morico was interviewed by police in his home, where he admitted to knowing Christine and Beatrice through his girlfriend, Cynthia, but he denied knowing anything about their murders or even stepping foot in their apartment. Morico did give police a sample of DNA, and it was sent off to the state lab in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, by late 2019. While they waited for the results to come back, investigators retrieved Morico's time card information from his then employer, the New York Department of Corrections. His time cards revealed that he was not at work at the time of the murders. He did not work on January 2nd, and his shift on January 3rd didn't begin until 7 a.m., plus his place of work was nearly five hours away from Christine and Beatrice's apartment. By January 2020, the lab came back saying that the DNA sample given by Morico's matched the DNA from the blood found at the crime scene. Police then interviewed Morico's half-brother, Carol Johnson Jr., who believed that their late father had owned a 25 caliber gun, the same kind used to kill the women, and that Morico inherited his belongings in 1998 after his death. They also interviewed Cynthia Swan, Morico's ex-girlfriend. The last incoming text on Christine's phone before she died was from Cynthia. She was asking Christine to call her, but Christine never responded. When police interviewed her, she stated that she and Christine were supposed to leave on January 1st to go on a weekend trip, but that they decided to stay home at the last minute so that Cynthia could be with a man named Benjamin June. According to Cynthia, around this time, Morico found out that she was having an affair with Benjamin. Police also interviewed Robert Sheen Spade, the father of Christine's oldest child. Robert told police that he had visited Christine, Beatrice, and the kids on the night of the murders. According to him, the women kept the apartment very clean, and he didn't notice any blood the night he was over. A of 2022, after using DNA to definitively link him to the blood at the crime scene, Morico was finally arrested and charged with the murders of Beatrice and Christine. He will appear in court in the following months. Renee Kuvas and Shannon Lloyd In 1987, 23-year-old Shannon Lloyd was living in a home she rented in Garden Grove, California. Her loved ones say she had an adventurous spirit and she was considered to be a tomboy who loved horses. On May 21st, however, she would be found dead in her bathroom after being sexually assaulted 
and strangled to death, and her murder would go unsolved for decades. Renee Kuvas was a 27-year-old mother who lived not far from Shannon. Her family members said that her son was her pride and joy, and that she loved him unconditionally. But on the morning of February 19, 1989, her body was found on Lambert Road in Irvine, California, by El Toro Marine Base. Not much else was released by police regarding her murder. Both Shannon and Renee's murders went unsolved for years. The next development didn't come until 2003, when authorities entered the DNA from Shannon's killer into CODIS, the Combined DNA Index System. This brought back a match to Renee's killer, letting investigators know that the same person had committed both crimes, but he still had no way of identifying who the suspect was. It wasn't until 18 years later, in 2021, that the Orange County District Attorney's investigative genetic genealogy team was finally able to name a suspect in Renee and Shannon's murders. Reuben J. Smith was born in Michigan, but was living in Orange County, California in the 1980s. In 1998, he was arrested in Las Vegas after he sexually assaulted and attempted to kill a woman. After this arrest, he was required to submit a DNA sample to authorities, putting him in the database. This year, in 2022, investigators were able to compare the samples and definitively match the DNA found at Renee and Shannon's crime scenes to Reuben Smith. Smith died by suicide after he shot himself in July of 1999 at the age of 39 before he could ever even face justice for the attack on the third unidentified woman. Investigators believe that he may be involved in other crimes and are actively looking into this possibility. Nadine Madger In January of 1980, 25-year-old Nadine Madger was living with her 28-year-old husband, Mark, who owned a local auto body shop and eight-month-old son, Daniel, in an apartment in Willoughby, Ohio. On the afternoon of January 11th, neighbors who lived in the Madger's apartment complex reported hearing a man screaming. When they looked to see where the screams were coming from, they saw Mark running out of the apartment holding his baby. He frantically handed Daniel to one neighbor, begging her to look after the baby until he can get in contact with the relative to take care of him. He told this neighbor that he had just returned home from work and found his wife dead on their kitchen floor. Willoughby police arrived at the scene just before 5 p.m. After some more investigation, it seemed that Nadine had been stabbed in her head, neck, and torso. Luckily, Baby Dan had been left unharmed, and he was found in his playpen just feet away from Nadine's body. Investigators suspected that the attack happened sometime between 1.15 and 4.45 p.m. There was no sign of forced entry into the apartment, and there was no evidence that the murder was sexually motivated. However, it did appear that Nadine put up a fight against her attacker, as chunks of the offender's skin were found under her fingernails and collected as evidence. Additionally, the only thing missing from the home was the knife used in the murder, which came from the kitchen, so police didn't believe that robbery was a motive either. There was blood found on Nadine's shirt that belonged to an unidentified male, and some of it was in perpendicular drops. This told investigators that the suspect was standing above Nadine's body while he was bleeding. One of Nadine's neighbors witnessed a bright yellow Dodge Dart car parked behind the apartment building around the time she would have been killed. They didn't recognize the car as belonging to anyone in the complex, and they hadn't seen it parked there before. Investigators tried to follow this lead, but it ultimately led nowhere. Nadine's husband, Mark, was soon ruled out as well. Not only did he pass a polygraph test, but he also had a solid alibi. He was at work all day. Nadine's case went cold until 2015 when police received a new lead from the DNA sample found on Nadine's shirt. The Lake County Crime Lab, Ohio Bureau of Criminal Investigation, and Lake County Prosecutor's Office teamed up with Parabon Nanolabs to use genetic genealogy to identify Nadine's killer. 
he found a potential match in a man named Stephen Joseph Simkak. Investigators then took the DNA sample from the crime scene and compared it against a sample from one of Simkak's children, and a match was found. Simkak was a former Marine who lived in Ohio with his wife and children at the time of Nadine's murder. Those who knew him in the 80s told investigators that he owned a yellow Dodge Dart at the time. Police looked into Simkak's time cards from his 37-year career at Lincoln Electric in Lucid, Ohio, only about 10 miles from Willoughby, where Nadine lived. In 1980, Simkak only missed one day of work, January 11th, the day of Nadine's death. He was scheduled to work the second shift that day, but called in sick. In 2002, Simkak retired and moved to Bemis Point, New York, near Buffalo. In 2018, at age 79, Stephen Stemkak passed away, leaving behind his wife, three biological children, and two stepchildren. Investigators are still unsure what a motive might be, as Mark, Nadine's then-husband, does not believe that Simkak knew Nadine. Police still encourage anyone with more information on this to come forward. Antonio and Luz Rodriguez In 2005, 80-year-old Antonio Rodriguez and his 77-year-old wife, Luz, were living in Cleveland, Texas. Cleveland is a small town that was known to be relatively safe and free of crime, averaging only one murder per year, and only a small percentage of their murders go unsolved. Antonio Zamora Rodriguez was born on August 8, 1924. In 1943, when he was 19 years old, he enlisted in the United States Army to fight in World War II. His wife, Maria de la Luz Rodriguez, was born on September 20th, 1927, and she was described as a selfless woman who would do anything for anyone. The two of them opened a grocery store when Antonio returned to Texas. The couple had 10 children and were known to be extremely generous to everyone in their community. Antonio and Luz ran a small but popular Mexican food restaurant out of their home for decades. The restaurant became a staple in Cleveland, and members of the community highly respected the couple. In their early 1990s, the couple decided to retire so they could spend more time with their family, especially their grandchildren. By the early 2000s, the Rodriguez's children checked in on their parents a lot as they were getting older and began experiencing some mild medical concerns. At this time, Carolina, the couple's youngest daughter, was checking in on her parents up to three times a day, every day. In 2004, one of Antonio and Luz's grandsons, Bernardino, was killed. Bernie, as he was called by loved ones, was described as his grandparents' baby, and his murder was especially hard for them. He was only 30 years old at the time of his death, and he had two young children. On October 29th, two men allegedly struck Bernardino repeatedly with a hammer and an axe over what was considered to be a grudge. Bernardino's body was left in the men's home for two days, and during those two days, the men went to Walmart to purchase a tarp, duct tape, and cleaning supplies to hide his body and clean up the crime scene. They then buried him in a rural area in a shallow grave. By November 2, 2004, his body was recovered, and just days later, his killers were arrested. Antonio and Luz, however, wouldn't live to see justice served for their grandson. On the morning of April 14, 2005, Antonio went to a local convenience store to buy some scratch-off lottery tickets, something he and Luz did regularly since their retirement. Shortly after he returned home, their daughter Carolina stopped by to check on him. While they visited, Antonio scratched off one of his tickets. At around 10 a.m., Carolina left to pick up something from the funeral home that handled Bernardino's services before heading 25 miles south to visit her sister Norma's restaurant and pick up lunch for her parents. She arrived back at their home shortly after 12 p.m. and immediately noticed that neither of them had gotten the mail from the mailbox yet, which was something her father normally did every day before lunchtime. She thought they had potentially fallen asleep 
especially when she didn't get a response when she entered the home and called their names. She continued walking through the house and eventually found them in their bedroom, but they were not asleep. Carolina found her father's body on the floor in the hallway outside the bedroom with blood running down his forehead. When she entered the bedroom, she found her mother's body in the bed. She had serious bruising on the side of her head, and both of them appeared to have been beaten in their heads and faces with a blunt object. It would be revealed later on that their causes of death were a combination of both the beatings and strangulation. Strangely, it seemed that the killer had placed Luz in the bed and tucked her in. At 12.45 p.m., Carolina called the police to report her parents' deaths. The investigation began immediately, and the police who arrived at the scene called for all of the department's detectives to join them on site. Investigators began by using scent-tracking dogs. The dogs tracked the suspect's scent across some railroad tracks to an apartment complex, but no further than that. Two persons of interest were taken into custody at the apartment complex, but they were released by the end of the day. Police collected surveillance footage from the convenience store where Antonio purchased the lottery tickets, but it didn't give up much information. According to detectives, they did fingerprints at the crime scene. They don't match any family member's fingerprints, and they were located on an object that the killer undoubtedly touched, according to the detectives. In addition to the fingerprints, there was also blood from an unknown suspect found on a rug in the home. A sample was taken and entered in the CODIS, the FBI's combined DNA index system, but there were no matches. After these failed attempts at getting leads, the case went cold for years. It wasn't until March of 2021 when investigators re-entered the sample into CODIS that a match was found. The DNA belonged to a now 41-year-old woman named Shelley Susan Thompson Limon, who was already serving a prison sentence in Texas for unrelated drug and property offenses. When police questioned Shelley, she told them she had no knowledge of the Rodriguez family or the deaths. They took a sample of her DNA to compare to the sample from the crime scene, and a match was made. On July 8, 2022, Shelley was arrested outside her parole office and charged with capital murder for the deaths of Antonio and Luz Rodriguez. The Rodriguez's daughter, Carolina, said that she never seen or heard of Shelley Thompson Lamone, and she didn't know of any connection between Shelley and her parents. She also believes there's a chance that Shelley didn't work alone and that other people were involved in her parents' murders. According to Antonio and Luz's children, their community never stopped supporting them and praying for a resolution in the case. <laughs>